right, welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. We are excited to have all of you guys with us <clears throat> to learn about shockwave therapy and nitric oxide for treating ED. I am Sarah Bryce. I'm the VP of Business Development for Gainswave, and I'll be moderating the webinar alongside John Halbert with Berkeley Life. We've got two really great speakers with us tonight. Dr. Dennis Kabinsky, a prominent urologist and men's sexual health expert out of Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and Greg McKetrick, a accomplished compounding pharmacist who has extensive expertise with nitric oxide and men's sexual health. So tonight we're going to be covering shockwave therapy with Dr. Kabinsky. We're going to be covering um, nitric oxide with Greg and followed by a combination therapy using the two and then a live Q&A. And we'll get started right now. I'm going to hand things off to Dr. Kubinski, who will take us through everything with shockwave therapy. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, everybody, for being here. We're going to talk about something that no guy wants to talk about, but rears its head for pretty much everybody over time, which is erectile dysfunction. I just read this earlier. This is exceptionally flattering. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a urologist, uh, originally from California moved to North Carolina for graduate school at Wake Forest and then medical school at Chapel Hill and back to Wake Forest for urology residency. At that point, I decided that Charleston, South Carolina was the best place to be. And I still feel that way. I've been here 17 years, the majority of which uh, as an employed urologist for a rapidly consolidating system, probably the biggest fork in the road for me occurred during COVID, not for necessarily the same reasons as most people, but it was the first time I probably had a break from practicing in 15 years to sort of take a breath and think about my 15 years in corporate medicine and in insurance dictated medicine and hospital based medicine. And I just wasn't really sure I wanted to go back to that. So um, I did something really crazy, something my wife would consider totally preposterous, which is I decided to get my MBA from Duke um, with two young kids and a full time job. So I did that. Um, and I did the health sector management program there. And I, I got to tell you, it did not make me feel any better about being in, in insurance dictated health care. So I put in my notice last June and in October, I opened a direct care practice called the Men's Center in Mount Pleasant. And let me tell you, it's been freaking awesome. I mean, I've had a hell of a time and I'm really enjoying it. It's been it's been great. If there's anybody out there who's considering making that kind of move, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to him. Um, so the majority of my practice, um, or at least a great part of it, is erectile dysfunction and sexual dysfunction in general. And I'm sure it's the same way for most of you out there. 52% um, of men admit to having some form of erectile dysfunction. The majority of those men who admit it are between 40 and 60. I mean, who knows? By the time you're 80, you may just not even care to admit it anymore. Um, a lot of people don't even mention it to their healthcare practitioners, particularly in a 10 minute visit. And I'm sure all of us have experienced the, oh, by the way, doc, like you do the whole visit and they're walking out the door and they turn around and go, by the way, doc, you got any of those blue pills? And it's like the last thing they say. Um, probably the most entertaining thing I've seen is as the PDE5 inhibitors have had sort of expanded indications um, like lower urinary tract symptoms or some of the new research indicating that they may potentially help prevent dementia. My patients are, they usually say, my erections are good, you know, but I'm peeing all the time. So how about some of that daily Cialis or my erections are good, but I think I'm forgetting things a lot. So how about some Viagra? So um, that's been really entertaining to see. I just don't like talking about it. Um, obviously the risk of sexual dysfunction tends to correlate with cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, smoking, uh, that's no secret. And then that's a, a great, that's a lot of why we're here to talk about vascular, vasculogenic ED. These are just some of the comorbidities um, that are associated with um, uh, erectile dysfunction. And again, what we're looking at here are neurogenic causes and vasculogenic causes. And I got to tell you, in 22 years of being in urology, I've never seen a great expl explanation as to why lower urinary tract symptoms are correlated with ED. Um, that's really been plausible, except for the fact that they all occur in old people. And as you get old, both things happen. So um, that's probably the biggest correlation. And also as somebody who's treated prostate cancer and done second opinions for prostate cancer for, um, oh gosh, almost 20 years, I would say 60% is probably a conservative estimate. Uh, I think the majority of men who've had at least a prostatectomy are experiencing uh, ED. And it, that's definitely the biggest downfall of being 
diagnosed with, with uh, prostate cancer. All right, causes of erectile dysfunction. So the, I start every conversation with a patient just kind of explaining what has to go right to get an erection, right? I mean, the first thing is you have to be aroused and you can't be distracted and you can't be thinking about your job and you can't be thinking about sports and you can't be thinking about, am I gonna be able to keep my erection? Then it's just like a vicious cycle, right? So you have to have focused arousal. Then you have your central nervous system fire, your spinal cord, your cavernosal nerves fire, dilate the arterial blood vessels, bring in blood flow into the corpora, compression of the veins to, to prevent leaking back out. So um, obviously vasculogenic is the most common cause. There's also, of course, psychogenic and neurogenic. Um, and thankfully, the cause that has the most potential treatment options. So one of the things I've really enjoyed about my practice and, and being in a direct care practice is the ability to offer all of the treatments under one roof, the time to sit down and discuss all of them with somebody and let them make their own decisions based upon their priorities and their budget and their beliefs and their biases. Um, so I'll kind of run down through those a little bit. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about shockwave therapy, which, uh, you know, is something that I didn't have a lot of experience in in my previous practice because there was almost no way to do it in hospital-based practice. Um, and it's been just a remarkable uh, eye-opener for me. Um, we're all familiar with the PD-5 inhibitors. We'll talk a little bit about those later. The, the granddaddy, sildenafil and tadalafil, and, and I, I do those right out of my office, and I think that's really a great service. Um, vacuum reaction devices, not a whole lot of people make that their go-to, but it certainly is an option, and it, it works in pretty much everybody. It's just clunky, obviously. I'm sure you all have seen Austin Powers when he was trying to go through the, the uh, security with one. Anyway, I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, <laughs> um, intercavernosal injection. Um, I worked with Greg a lot when I was in my other practice. He, he mixed a lot of our trimix and bimix, and, and those are exceptionally effective, um, and we use those quite a bit. Obviously, you can put a penile implant in. I don't have much experience with vascular surgery, but I do know it's kind of a burgeoning concept, um, and obviously, you can only bypass large vessels. It doesn't really help with small vessel disease. Um, PRP is an interesting thing. You know, I, I don't usually promote PRP as a standalone treatment. Not that it doesn't have theoretical advantages, but I just haven't seen great data on it. But there is a huge theoretical synergy with Shockwave, uh, with PRP. Um, and I do think there, there, there need to be some studies looking at Shockwave versus Shockwave plus PRP, because of course, as we're gonna discuss, Shockwave causes release of endothelial growth factor from platelets. And if you can over-concentrate the platelets, there's a theoretical advantage to that. Um, peptides are really interesting. So, again, something that's relatively new to me, but I do use PT-141. You, you probably have heard of it as the female Viagra. It's FDA approved for females with hypoactive sex drive. Um, but I have had a lot of males with pretty refractory ED and low, low libido do really well with it. And it's just a, it's a subcutaneous injection three or four hours before sex. I offer a lot of supplements in my office. I'm a huge believer, at least in the synergies and the potentials of supplements, um, as long as they are sourced responsibly from a reputable source. And that's some of my stress with all my patients. But I use a lot of Tonka Ali and things like that. All right, we're going to talk about shockwave therapy. So when I decided to move to this type of practice, uh, obviously shockwave therapy was immediately on my radar and I did a lot of research on it because I wanna make sure that I'm selling something that um, makes sense and that I understand the mechanism and that I understand the data and I know what devices are out there. And it is really clear from in vitro and animal studies that shockwave therapy causes increased expression of vascular endothelial growth factor of endothelial nitric oxide synthase and among other things um, and based upon that um, it, we started to use it in people in clinical studies even double blinded placebo controlled trials looking at low intensity shockwave therapy have shown a statistically significant difference from sham treatment based upon IIEF scores so it was, it was an easy sell and something that, again, that I've been really impressed with. Um, I can talk, I can hang all day in conversations about uh, biology. I can't hang at all in conversations about physics. Um, and so I can't tell you a ton about the physics, except to tell you that what I tell my patients is that shockwave causes microscopic trauma 
which allows your body's own healing mechanisms to cause regrowth of blood vessels. Um, and because of that, actually shockwave therapy is being used for a lot of different indications, it's being used for orthopedic indications. It's being used for, um, there, I've seen some studies actually looking at recovery from ischemic injury in hearts even. Um, for me, what is near and dear to my heart is uh, I know some of the major league soccer teams use it for recovery from um, Achilles tendon injury. I actually ruptured my Achilles tendon on Tuesday and I'm getting surgery tomorrow. So I'm going to be really interested in shockwave to help me heal with it. Um, a little bit about uh, the mechanism of action, which we touched upon already. Um, the shockwave treatment causes shear stress, which causes um, release of growth factors. So the first one, nitric oxide oxide synthase. We all know what nitric oxide does for an erection, right? So nitric oxide synthase essentially takes L-arginine and molecular oxygen and makes nitric oxide, which is a small gaseous neurotransmitter. Nitri nitric oxide in the penis and in, in other smooth muscle, when released, causes an in increase in guanylate cyclase expression, which causes an increase in cyclic GMP, which causes dilation, relaxation of vascular smooth muscle, which allows blood to come in. And then phosphodiesterase 5 breaks down the cyclic GMP. Therefore, that's why we use cyclodiesterase 5 um, inhibitors. Or, sorry, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. And so all of that, whoops, let me go back. Um, it also, I, I don't want to leave out VEGF, Vasto, vascular endothelial growth factor is released by a number of cells in the body, particularly um, platelets, um, and that, that causes basically neovascularization, so new micro blood, micro size blood vessels grow. And so again, this is just kind of a schematic of, of what um, happens um, with shockwave therapy. Um, if you look at the in vitro and animal studies, one shockwave treatment causes increase in expression in these growth factors for about eight weeks. Um, and you begin to see regeneration of blood vessels in about four weeks. So what are the benefits of shockwave therapy? Well, number one, it's easy. It doesn't hurt. There's almost no risk of it. Um, so the, the side effect profile is essentially close to zero. Of course, there's nothing we can do with no risk. It takes about 15 minutes. There's no drug interactions other than you can't be on a blood thinner. And the treatments themselves, they aren't cheap, but in the grand scheme of things, they're cost effective. Mm -hmm. They can get you off medications for the long run. These are the things that patients report. I can tell you in my practice, um, what I initially, patients would tell me is that they would begin to see just sort of, sort of increased flaccid girth, kind of increased baseline blood flow. They begin to see increased um, morning erections and nocturnal erections, uh, general increase in quality of erections and, um, and decreased refractory period, increased efficacy of PDE5 inhibitors. Um, in people who are on ICI, on injections, they tend to end up using smaller amounts, um, smaller uh, concentrations and volumes because there is better blood supply. Um, the interesting thing for me being a, a, a prostate cancer surgeon for so long is the post prostatectomy patients. Um, you know, shockwave therapy is not a treatment for neurogenic ED. So if you've had a non nerve bearing prostatectomy, it's probably not what the, the way to go. That being said, the majority of prostatectomies are nerve sparing. But what we see with a prostatectomy, and Greg is very familiar with this, is you see a period after the surgery of a neuropraxia. So the, the nerves are irritated and damaged, but they're not eliminated. They just don't fire very well for about six months or so. And during that time, when they're not firing, the nitric oxide is not being released, the blood vessels aren't dilating, good healthy blood's not coming in, you can develop fibrosis and atrophy of the vascular system. So it's really important to do rehab. We call it penile rehab during that time to try to increase blood flow and, and help with healing so that I always say it's like if you're working out during the off season, when the season rolls around, you're ready to go. So. I think that in a lot of patients who experience permanent ED after a prostatectomy, a nerve sparing prostatectomy in particular, it's because of atrophy of those blood vessels. And so I think that's a, a, a reasonable way to approach that conversation regarding shockwave 
certainly the data is not as good as people who have not had a prostatectomy, but it is um, an option. What I would really love to see is shockwave used in a clinical trial for penile rehab. I think that would be really interesting. And that's that type of um, approach is being used in other, other organ systems. So who are the best patients for shockwave treatment? Um, obviously vasculogenic ED, that's your sweet spot. So those are gonna be people who get either a good or partial response to Viagra or Cialis. If you get no response to Vi Viagra or Cialis, you may have either just such severe vascular disease or probably have a neurogenic component um, or maybe a severe psychogenic component. Um, so in most of these cases, we're looking at vasculogenic ED. But again, I mentioned trimix injection patients. I have some that just don't get super great inject response to trimix or they require a lot. The only reason that could conceivably ever happen is because they just have terrible blood flow. Because trimix does not need a psychogenic, it doesn't need arousal, it doesn't need nerves to fire in order to work. And so in those patients, um, you know, you can't offer shockwave therapy as a way to perhaps reduce their, their, their need for um, ICI. So um, as far as gains wave goes, you know, I, I thought a lot about it, uh, about whether or not to be um, um, a gains wave affiliated doctor. And for me, it was a no brainer. I mean, they have a great uh, network uh, they, that you can take advantage of their advertising and their website. Uh, they have good training. We use their trainers. Um, we use their protocols um, and uh, they have a really, really good team, which I'm sure a lot of you know already. All right, I'm gonna move ahead to Greg. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate it. And thanks, for everybody, for coming in, Doc. That was great. Super presentation. Uh, again, my name is Greg McCatrick. I am a compounding pharmacist, which some of you may not be terribly familiar with, but we don't dispense the, uh, the traditional medications. We're actually making custom meds that uh, are really suited to the individual patient. Um, that's a little bit about me. And as Dr. Kubinski had mentioned, I've done a lot of work with ED patients and with uh, patients who are post-prostatectomy in terms of doing the penile rehab. We have a, a protocol that we use specifically for that. Um, in some cases, we call it prehab because sometimes we're using that same therapy for patients who are anticipating surgery like a, a penile implant. So very interesting. Um, give you a little bit more about my background first, because you know, I knew for a long time that you know, nitric oxide was a very important factor when we're working with erectile function. And I incorporated probably a dozen different nitric oxide boosters over the course of the years. Um, it's not a secret. This is, this is something that's very well known. Uh, actually in 1992, Nitric oxide was named the molecule of the year. About six years later in 98, it was actually awarded a Nobel Prize, the research that was done using nitric oxide on cardiovascular function. Um, so again, this is a, a metabolic gas. It's, a, it's in our body. It needs to be there. It supports our system, certainly supports blood flow and very, very important to our longevity problem with a lot of things is as we get older, we just don't make as much as we ought to. And that is the same case with nitric oxide. So, you know, nobody worries about ED when they're 18 and, you know, they're just firing on all cylinders. But with nitric oxide in our endogenous production, typically by about the age of 40, and you can see here in the graphs how the, the endothelial structure changes and the drop off in the scale, but by about the age of 40, we're down to about a 50% production rate of our natural nitric oxide. By 60, that number drops to about 15%. Now, as, as Dr. K mentioned, you know, it's very common when you get that door handle conversation at the doctor's office and, you know, doc's on the way out to the next room and the fellow says, hey, by the way, well, you know, that's very common in that right around that, you know, mid 40s, mid 50s age. And it's not coincidental that that's happening about the time we're seeing this kind of falling off the table in terms of the amount of nitric oxide production in the system. 
So we're starting to see depletion of nitric oxide, depletion of blood flow. We're seeing a weakening of the blood vessels along with all of the comorbidities that will develop because of that. So one thing that I always point out, and, and you know, I think it rings true, Dr. Kaminsky said the same thing. We see patients come in for erectile dysfunctional consults all the time, and you know, we always let them know, you know we, we consider ED kind of the canary in the coal mine for heart disease. So if the first symptom happens to be an issue with erectile dysfunction, then it's, it's, you know, just natural course should be to make sure that the cardiovascular system is in good shape as well. So as you can see that, uh, that graph shows the drop in nitric oxide production with age. Um, and typically, again, if you figure men who are being started on the PDE fives, like the Viagra or Cialis in that 50 ish window, they are starting on therapy once their system has already substantially diminished in terms of endogenous nitric oxide production. So they're kind of starting off at a point where they've already got one foot in the hole, so to speak. Here's the kind of kick in the butt that goes along with that. Um, about the time we're seeing this significant drop off, the pathway that our body uses to convert most of these substances, and Doc mentioned L-arginine. Um, when I mentioned that I had used a lot of different nitric oxide products in the past, well, the, the main reason I think I didn't really have the greatest success was because they were primarily all amino acid-based products, L-arginine, L-citrulline. Um, if I was working with guys who were 30 or 35 years old, I probably would have had a substantially different response. But if the patient is 60 or 65, and you're treating with the amino acids, there's a substantial problem to that because L-arginine has to go through a conversion. It goes through nitric oxide synthase conversion to become nitric oxide in the body. Well, that the pathway actually starts to break down about the same time that our natural production of nitric oxide is breaking down. So there's a significant difference if you're using what would be considered a dietary nitrate because it's not having to go through a conversion. The body is able to use that very rapidly, convert that into systemic nitrate. And you know, that's where we're gonna see the benefit. And that's where uh, you can see a real difference in terms of the, the supplements and the products. Berkeley Life is not an amino acid based product. Um, it is a combination of vitamins, beetroot, potassium nitrate. It is considered a dietary nitrate an inorganic nitrate. And because of that, very rapidly absorbed and available for the system. So there's a lot of different factors that go in. I mentioned age. That's kind of the, the dirty bird out of all of them because you can't really stop the aging process. But, you know, unfortunately, that's not the only thing that influences this. Um, I do a lot of talks about nitric oxide. I, I present this, I train uh, staff members around the country on how to use this product and how to work with their patients. And alarmingly, I find a lot of you know, 25 to 30 year old patients when we do the nitric oxide test come back very depleted. Well, so what are the, what are the other reasons that you can have problems in terms of your, your natural nitric oxide levels? Well, obviously aging, the big one is diet. You know, as Americans, we eat what's called the SAD diet, and that is not conducive to generating uh, nitric oxide. We don't eat a green diet anymore. You know, for the most part, a lot of folks just don't exercise the way they should. Um, exercise builds up the production of nitric oxide and really helps the system. And there are a lot of medications on the market that will absolutely deplete your nitric oxide. You know, how many people are put on medicine for stomach acid, the, the proton pump inhibitors, uh, they really block production of nitric oxide in, in the gastric system. So that's certainly one way where we can see a significant drop off. Another, uh, believe it or not, using mouthwash because it, it's killing off enzymes in the oral cavity. And there's a lot of production that's based from there. 
throw in the the outside factors you know stress life stress pollution um and certainly there's genetic factors incorporated so there's a lot of different things that can influence the level of nitric oxide in your body um a lot of folks say well can't i just change my diet well yeah sure you can are you going to eat beets and spinach and arugula on a routine basis enough quantity of those to significantly increase your nitrate levels most people that i talk to look at me like i'm a squirrel as soon as i say that because there's no way they're going to put down their steak and their potato and pick up the the greens on the table so um, taking the supplements just works better for them so i mentioned a little bit in terms of you know the other applications with nitric oxide obviously cardiovascular this is a huge factor um for those of you who don't know you know when when the medication viagra actually came to market it was a <laughs> kind of a happy side effect they were studying medication called rivashio which was sildenafil for pulmonary hypertension just so happened that all the guys in the study were walking around very happy so this was kind of a happy uh, discovery that they had. So, you know, it's very good for the cardiovascular system. Obviously has great function for, for sexual function. And that's for men and for women. Um, any forms of, of neuropathy, if you think in terms of supplying more blood flow into damaged tissue, this is going to be a uh, real benefit. Um, with diabetes, there is an increase as you increase nitric oxide levels, you increase glucose metabolism. I can't tell you how many of my patients who I'm treating for ED come back and will report to me that, you know, their, their morning blood sugar had dropped by 20 to 25 points. And the only change they had made was introducing the Berkeley Life nitric oxide. Um, everybody knows nitric oxide boosters for, you know, getting in the gym or cycling or what have you. It's a great way to increase your exercise tolerance and reduce your recovery time. Um, I've got, again, guys that show up, they'll have their pulse oximeter on their finger walking in the door because they want to show me their numbers. So just, just a lot of different factors that come into play. Um, we were talking before this about some of the other things. And again, it's, if, you, if you can imagine any metabolic function in the body that would be improved by increased blood flow, it should apply. So again, kind of coming back to what Doc was saying, traditional ED treatments. So like we said, you know, as we're getting into that area, 45 to 55 years of age, we're seeing the onset of a lot of these uh, conditions and more problems. So, you know, guys are being put on medications like Viagra. And for a lot of them, my Viagra will work with about 65% of guys. The problem is that Viagra typically has a, a very short effective life. It's usually maybe five, six years. And then it stops working. This is a pretty easy correlation to make because if you think in terms, like I mentioned, by the time these patients are being started on that PDE5 inhibitor, they are already on this severe downslope in terms of nitric oxide production. Well, that, that downslope doesn't turn off. You know, they're just skiing downhill at that point. So after the five, six years is up and they've done nothing to really reestablish their natural system, there's not enough gas left in the tank. You, know, you think in terms of, you know, trying to start an engine and you're turning the crank and you're turning the crank and you're turning the crank and you know it's it's ticking over but that's all you're getting out of it well it's because there's no gas in the tank and this is really very similar to that um so again by supplementing the nitric oxide system we can really benefit and increase the effect of these pde5 inhibitors um testosterone although not going to be a cure for ed it certainly does have a benefit in here because it does increase uh, the nitric oxide production. So that's, that's a great play along. Again, here we see another 
mention in terms of the drugs that really have a negative effect on nitric oxide production. So they can certainly influence the, uh, the appearance and presence of erectile dysfunction. Same basic mentality applies to female sexual function. I know the, the parts are different, but the plumbing's the same. So increased blood flow increases sensitivity, increases the, the capacity for orgasm, increases lubrication. The nice thing about nitric oxide, it works for both men and women. As you increase the level, you increase sexual response, uh, increase clitoral engorgement, increase the engorgement of the vaginal tissue. So again, increase sensitivity. Another really neat component of this, uh, because nitric oxide is a, uh, a signaling molecule. So it's releasing an additional amount of oxytocin and uh, the, the luteinizing hormone, releasing hormones into the body. So oxytocin, that's the cuddle drug. Now we use oxytocin for both men and women when we're working with issues of anorgasmia or a sexual dysfunction. So again, a happy side effect of boosting that nitric oxide level. The neat thing with the Berkeley Life, and this was the catch for me, and I'll be honest with you, this has been probably the, the biggest factor in being able to really get this message across to my patients. They have a patented saliva test strip. It's about a 15 second deal to do this test. What it allows you to do is have almost an instantaneous diagnostic that you can show your patient. Um, if you're in a conversation, if you're in a consultation with a patient, and you know you're you're delving into this arena then you know by all means you keep talking they put this test strip on their tongue within 15 seconds you can see where their levels are sitting a really nice little party trick with this is if you do that and then give a couple of capsules as a sample to try within 90 minutes to two hours if they retest they're going to see a significant difference in that level and it's a really simple test. It's something that you can just send to patients that can do it at home. Um, we've had great success with this simply because of the fact that it gives a visual for the patient. They can really see it's a palpable response. As I mentioned, I tried a lot of different nitric oxide products in the past. About six years ago, I met up with the folks with Berkeley Life and the number one, the product is excellent. The product works. The test strips are great, but they've been a phenomenal company to work with in terms of the support. Uh, we have a great uh, back and forth in terms of sharing ideas and concepts, and they develop super ma support material for us that just makes it that much simpler in terms of getting the message to patients uh, leave behind bags or bag stuffers or, or shelf stockers just so that the patients have access and they can really see what this is about and they can learn if, if they're interested. They have access so they can actually find the, uh, the retailers who sell it and get their questions answered. A couple of things here that, that come up very frequently. Um, and again, these are questions that have been posed to us. So, you know, one recommendation that we have, if you've got patients that are coming in and they're 40 plus, it should be automatic. Test their, test their nitric oxide levels right out the gate. And if they're depleted, again, just a really good way to start the conversation. Are you familiar with nitric oxide and the impact it has on circulatory function and more specifically sexual function? And we get these uh, great feedback pieces from patients as well. Just talking about how you know, important healthy blood flow is and the significance of being able to impact that and improve it. Um, personally, I see this as a perfect tie on to, to the shockwave therapy. If we can increase the nitric oxide level prior to or during the course of the shockwave treatment, the outcome can only be better. 
you're going to increase blood flow. You're going to, you're going to basically stage the body. Just like doc said, you know, rehab is training in the off season. Well, this is kind of getting you ready. This is the warm up for the game. So tying these things together, putting the tools in place, giving the patient the best advantage in terms of the outcomes. And these are the pieces that are going to fit together to make that happen. I mentioned to you before, what is in Berkeley Life? Again, it's a dietary nitrate. So you can see there's vitamin C, thiamine, B12, potassium nitrate, and beetroot. So it's a very natural product. Like I mentioned, it's a natural marriage. Combining the, the shockwave therapy to stimulate the nitric oxide to support it, these things go together very well. That's and great, there, guys. <clears throat> yeah, that's awesome. Y'all did such a great job. Thank you so much. Just talking about combination therapy for a second, um, can one or both of you kind of go through, um, you know, a couple of things. So are there any situations where you would put a patient just on nitric oxide or just on shockwave therapy without the combination? Right. I, I can say for Patients who come in for uh, a consultation and they have pretty decent function already and they're more concerned that maybe things are tailing off a little bit, um, the supplement by itself can make a lot of sense. But that is somebody who is, is in pretty good shape already and really they're not at a point where they need to invest in you know, a, a, a higher dollar therapy. Anybody else, I think that it is kind of just the, the part of the main platter to put it in there. And I don't care if that's for, you know, somebody who's, who's starting on PDE5s because we've seen the effect, the benefit of tying this to PDE5s and the increased function. Doc mentioned with, with the penile injections, being able to reduce the formula strength or the dosages and get the same effect. And then again, just really the benefit in tying it in with the shockwave therapy, uh, you're going to, you're going to have better outcomes overall. Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. In terms of prevention, we've got a lot of people, um, Gainswave providers now that are treating younger men as more of a preventative or a way to sort of boost their performance. Would would you guys, well, Dr. Kubinski, do you see many men coming in for that um, and Greg as well? And do you guys suggest putting them on nitric oxide at an earlier age or starting shockwave therapy as a, as a way to sort of um, prevent this going forward? Yeah. I mean, honestly, in a perfect world, of course, you'd want to do shockwave therapy on, on people for prevention. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, you begin to develop vasculogenic ED probably in your thirties. And so, if you can reverse that process rather than treat the symptoms later or try to go back, you know, retrospectively and go back later and treat the, the, the process, it would be, it would be great to do so. I can't say I get a lot of your men coming in looking for that because of course, you know, they're, they're not really, there's, there's a cost benefit ratio in everything we do. Right. And so if they're not quite seeing the lifestyle circumstances, they're probably not going to seek that. Um, although, you know, it would be an, it would be great to be able to do that. And, and I think that as far as the combination therapy goes, you know, there it would be great to have head to have st head to head studies looking at, for instance, shockwave therapy versus shockwave plus plus uh, the Berkeley Life product or something similar, plus, sh you know, Ber shockwave plus sh placebo that hasn't been done yet. But there's a lot of theoretical reasons that Greg pointed out that there's going to be synergies there. And whenever I see something where there's a theoretical advantage, but not necessarily a proven advantage yet, you, it's another time you think about cost benefit, right? I mean, these are not expensive medications. There's almost no downside. There's significant theoretical benefit. So I do try to encourage people to do something to increase their nitric oxide levels during shockwave, because again, what we're doing, we're increasing nitric oxide, um, oxide nitric oxide synthase, but you have, you have to have the substrates in order to make nitric oxide, right? Um, and you want to try to have as much release during the treatment. So you're bringing in the fresh blood and the platelets that are going to release the VEGF and whatnot. So there's just a lot of potential um, theoretical synergies there and almost no downside. So 
you know, if it were expensive or potentially harmful, it would be a different, a different discussion. And like I mentioned, I test a lot of folks that are, are really not my target population of patients. A lot of times it's just because they think it's fun to do the test or they're standing there in a group. And the amount of response that we see with folks who are in their late 20s or 30s who are already very depleted is significant. So I think that there's a, there's a lot of justification for starting early. Great. All right, John, do you want to take over Q&A? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, sir. And thanks, uh, Greg and Dr. Kabinski. We've had a, a, a lot of questions coming through, so I don't think we'll be short of, of items to cover here. But I'll try and just bounce back and forth. And where there's kind of hybrid questions, we can just kind of toss it up for whoever wants to take it. Um, so the first one is, is for you, uh, Dr. Kabinski, and it's related to what, uh, what do you like to use to evaluate ED types? Um, so vasculogenic, psychogenic, neurogenic, what's your process in doing that? Honestly, I think you can almost, in almost every case, it can just be done based on history. Um, you know, I mean, if somebody has no reason to have neurogenic ED, they have no, no neurologic symptoms, um, you can pretty much rule out neurogenic. Um, psychogenic, you know, if you do a good history, they're going to, that's going to sneak in there. You know, you ask them about their relationship with their spouse. You ask them about stress at work. You ask them about performance anxiety. That's going to sneak in there for sure. And of course, you can, if a 22 year old comes with ED, 99% of the time, it's psychogenic. Um, so I don't do any formal evaluation for that. I mean, I have really long discussions with my patients when I go through their ED treatment options, and we can generally just go based upon the odds and the history in most cases. Um, the, the hardest, the biggest curveball is the psychogenic because if you're 22 years old and you have ED, you pretty much have psychogenic ED. But if you're 60 and you're starting to experience some vasculogenic ED, the psychogenic sneaks in again because you start to have performance anxiety. You start to think more about, am I going to be able to please my wife and keep my erection than actually thinking about your wife? So I always make sure that they understand that. But I don't really do a formal evaluation unless there's just something really odd about the case, in which case you can do penile Dopplers. Greg, anything on that? Or I know you obviously deal with this a lot too. Anything additional? Well, we do uh, an intake survey with our patients to try to get a good history on, just like Doc said. And, you know, based on comorbidities, based on what their history is. And unfortunately, yeah, there, there's a lot of psychogenic because we get into the psychology of things and it's performance anxiety. And there's, there's, you know, unfortunately, a lot of pornography addiction and different things that play in. But, uh, I think from, from that standpoint, the history is going to be your gold standard. And it, one of the questions we get asked the most commonly, and I'm sure you get asked too, Greg, it's asked here in relation to female sexual function, but for any patients, when they ask you how long before they see an impact on their sexual function after mm -hmm. starting with nitric oxide, how do you, how do you set expectations there? Well, and again, what happens with this is it's very rapidly absorbed into the system. So, uh, this is something where within 90 minutes to two hours, you have significantly elevated the systemic nitric oxide load. And you can tell that by the, the salivary nitrate test. Um, so it does not take a long time for this to build in the system. Uh, the, the basis of doing this and using it on a daily basis is significant because you want to support the system. But again, within your first dose with first few doses you're certainly going to see a difference and i see again obviously we're talking about sexual function but i'll be at conferences ce conferences that sort of thing and we'll do these tests and we'll, we'll hand out samples and when you have a, a table of nurses and doctors come back over and you know it's two hours after they were given the sample and they say i am so much more focused i'm alert i was literally in brain fog prior to this, now I'm on top of the world, you know this is having a significant effect for you rapidly. Um, uh, Dr. Kabinski, then how, how long would you wait to treat a patient to after nerve sparring prostatectomy? Well, I can't say, I, you know, I've never used it for rehab, um, frankly. I, I just think that's something that would be a really interesting concept to, to do. I mean, part of that is because when I was in um, a hospital employed group, 
we didn't have shockwave. That's when I was doing all my prostatectomies. And so now that I'm doing this other practice, I don't really see a lot of post prostatectomy immediately fresh patients. Um, but I think that was a, would be a really interesting. Um, first of all, there's no down. I, I can see no downside in doing it immediate, almost immediately after surgery. You're not going to injure anything. I, I wouldn't treat the anastomosis probably. You know, I might skip the perineum, but I would certainly do the the, the shaft. That, I, I would see no downside of that. But it would be really great to see a study. Um, so. When I did prostatectomies a lot, I started people in rehab about three weeks out with a VED and plus or minus Cialis and Viagra and things like that. So it would be a reasonable time to start doing shockwave right around then. At that point, the anastomosis is healed and there's probably very little downside. So, you know, if somebody has the ability to do that, um, their office is set up that way. I think it'd be a really interesting thing to pursue. And sticking to the kind of more, more technical, is there any benefit to performing shockwave with the, uh, apologies now for my non-clinical background, but the two-messed penis versus flaccid? <laughs> it's T-U-M-E-S. Yeah, that just means soft. <laughs> soft versus hard. Um, yeah. I don't know. I've wondered that myself. Um, and I can tell you I've had quite a people get uh, two-messed during um, shockwave. Uh, I'm not sure if I should be... Um, um, complimented by that or what, but it does happen um, a fair amount. Um, I can't, you know, it's actually easier to do it when they have an interaction because it doesn't slip off as much and you you know, got a little lube on there and it's, 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 it's difficult otherwise to keep contact. Um, but theoretically, I, I don't think it would help in general because generally during tumescence, you have stas stasis of blood. So you're not getting fresh blood coming in and going out. So I can't think of any reason why it would be better with, with an erect penis. Okay. Um, and then two questions, Greg, just clarifying on the test strip. Can you clarify what the test strip exactly is measuring? Uh, it's nitrates in the saliva. Okay. Um, and then in terms of dosing, kind of questions here about the ideal time of day to dose. So, mm -hmm. you know, what's your standard protocol that you're recommending to most of your patients as it relates to, to Berkeley Life? So a lot of that has to do with the patient's lifestyle. Um, now, Berkeley Life, we incorporate that into our, our penile rehab protocol or the, the post-prostatectomy uh, protocol. Like Dr. Kabinsky was talking, starting about three weeks after surgery, we start them on the Tadalafil, the Berkeley Life, start them using the, the VED, uh, get them on a schedule of physical therapy and, and doing their Kegel exercises. So that becomes part of their, you know, their daily vitamin routine. As we start to get towards more function, where they're starting to see return of erectile function, natural return, or return with other medication, whatever the case might be, we can tailor the dose a little bit so that we want to hit, uh, you know, maximum body concentration uh, when they need it. So if there are someone who they are sexually active at 10 o'clock at night, you know, probably is going to behoove them to take their nitric oxide a little bit later in the day or take a morning dose and then do a repeat dose at dinner time so that they have a, a nice high level in their system when they want it. Um, for some patients who, you know, really just want to take the two capsules one time a day, if they are strictly a, you know, evening person as far as sexual activity, then probably taking it in the late afternoon is better for them. For overall function, I generally tell folks to take it in the morning, two capsules at one time. And a question, I guess, okay, both of you can answer, but it's related to the, I suppose, the epidemic of low testosterone in young men and how you feel that factors into the cases of ED that you're seeing in your practices. Jeez, wow, that's it. You know, the, the testosterone thing is really interesting. Um, you know, we were always taught that testosterone is not a treatment for ED. Um, you know, that there's a saturation, a certain saturation of testosterone you need, which is relatively low. Um, that being said, um, anecdotally, testosterone really does help most people with their ED, um, just generally, probably for some of the physiologic reasons that Greg pointed out, but also just because of increase in arousal. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing about low testosterone is that when you look at a, a normal testosterone, you're not, it shouldn't really be called normal or abnormal range, it's really a reference range. A reference range is where they test 10,000 of your cohort and they, they find the mean and they go two standard deviations either way and they make a bell curve and they call two standard deviations from the mean either way. That's the reference range and it's really broad. 
It doesn't mean that in that 95%, everybody has a healthy testosterone. It just means that that's what they're gonna call the reference range. But the interesting thing is the whole reference range has shifted over the past 50 years. It's actually moved down probably for environmental reasons. So what we consider the normal range now doesn't even, it's not even the same as it was uh, when people were healthier. So that's a long winded answer, but I guess, um, you know, what I am seeing is are a lot of people who have testosterones within the reference range, who have no interest in sex um, and who are not performing the way they want to. And if we move their testosterone, keep it in the reference range, but maybe move it up to the 75th percentile instead of the 10th percentile, we're seeing a lot of a lot of improvement in sex lives, no question about it. And, and I would expect uh, that to a degree simply because if you increase the testosterone level in those patients, the ones who are not performing well, what other effects within their system are you going to see? Are they going to exercise more? Right, are they right. going to have better body image? Are they going to be more self-confident? Certainly their libido is going to be higher. So there, there are other effects that certainly play into it. And, you know, unfortunately we are a fairly, uh, we just don't exercise. We don't eat right. That's not our society anymore. So we're seeing it at a younger and younger age. Yeah, not to mention mood. I mean, you see a lot of really improvement with mood. So, I mean, that, that's going to affect your sex drive. And a, a couple of questions here. I'm going to just uh, amalgamate into one for you, Greg. Anything kind of contraindication-wise you look out for before recommending nitric oxide, uh, other medications, patient pre-existing conditions, et cetera? Yeah, you know, the big thing would be somebody who has a, a bleeding disorder or someone who's on blood thinner, like a Coumadin. Um, you know, we don't want to throw their their numbers off the chart. It's not necessarily something that's going to rule it out, but I definitely at that point, I'm going to, you know, bring in their, their physician. And if there needs to be any kind of changes made, if, if the benefit of the nitric oxide is perceived to be significant enough, we may need to make adjustments to other medication therapy. Other than that, you know, it's certainly, like I mentioned, it improves glucose metabolism. It certainly is going to help with blood pressure, circulatory function in general. So there's a lot of benefits to it. There's not a whole lot of risks. If, if people can eat, basically, if people can eat spinach, then there's really no reason they cannot take this. Um, um, one last question then for each of you. Uh, Dr. Kubinski, I know you're relatively you know, new. I think October, you said you opened your practice. How many patients are you seeing are treating with shockwave therapy now on a weekly basis? Um, so I, I tend to, so I offer people um, twice a week or once a week because there's data for both. Um, we probably do um, 20, 20 to 25 treatments a week, um, I would say. So, you know, I, I think we've maybe got 30 people out there approximately who are currently in their, their cycle. Um, and, you know, I do things, I really try hard not to be a salesman in my practice. And so, you know, everybody generally offers, you can have a, a pack of six or packs a pack of 12. Uh, and I tell most of my patients, you know, try six. If you feel like you're seeing improvement, then I would keep going. If you're not, just stop. And I, I can't tell you, it's really rare that people don't say, wow, I, I want to just go ahead and keep going and do the full 12 because I'm really starting to see some improvement. And I'm excited about it. And then same for you, Greg, like how many, how many people are supposed to be having the conversation with about Berkey life on a weekly basis and how long do they generally stay on the product? Um, amazing. That's a high number. Uh, again, we've been carrying Berkeley life now for about six years. And I think every single month, the, the sales of Berkeley have gone up. The, the big impact has really been with our, our male population. We certainly sell to a lot of women, but, our male population, our ED patients, um, th all I can tell you is it works because we see patients who were on uh, penile injections being able to go back and start getting the benefit from the PDE5 inhibitors. And when you can actually get function returned to a patient using a less invasive method at a nominal cost for them, it becomes an automatic the, it's it's the our our repeat purchasing is really the biggest signifier in terms of showing the success of the product i could go on about anecdotal information and stories but it's the repeat customers that come back and they keep telling us you know i want this 
I want it automatically refilled with, with my Tadalafil every month. So uh, like I said, the numbers just keep going up and I'm really excited because you know, we're getting an opportunity to kind of take it to a broader audience now. Um, and I think that's just a, a great thing to happen. Actually, there was a question that came up that maybe Sarah can answer um, from Lisa. Is it Feller? Gosh, my eyes are terrible. Feiler? Feiler, yeah, yeah Feiler. About maintenance treatments after 12 treatments. And I, I have to say maintenance after doing 12. And that's something I've actually wondered about. It's kind of a data-free zone, you know. And what we do know is that the, the efficacy has been shown to be up to two years. But the process that caused the ED persists, right? I mean, the cholesterol or the hypertension or whatever caused the, vas the vascular disease. So there's going to be some regression. Um, and what I, I don't really know, I would love to know what most people are doing for, for maintenance. Because what I've told my patients is maybe after a year, you might want to think of getting one quarterly, but it's pretty arbitrary. Yeah, you know, we've got, um, we've got people doing a, a variety of different things. Typically, what we recommend is doing a maintenance treatment on an annual basis basis. Um, and that's typically about half the number of treatments they will start with originally. So exactly. um, what, what most people do is have them fill out a shim score, um, you know, the survey beforehand and then go from there. But you can do it an, on an annual ba basis. You can also do it on a quarterly basis. Some men prefer to come in just once a month and do one treatment. So there's many different ways that you can do it. And I think it just depends person to person and what their goals are. Gotcha. Hey. All right. Great. Well, y'all, this has been so amazing and, and we've gotten the best feedback and comments from, from everyone. And I really mm -hmm. appreciate you both being here tonight um, we got a special promotion for all of the webinar registrants this evening. And um, if you want to find out more, you can just click on the, you know, scan the QR code. We'll also be emailing out a link to view the recording of the webinar um, tomorrow. And, um, and we're just really excited to have everyone here and would love to talk to you more about your practice and find out if this is maybe a good fit for you, both with Gainswave and Berkeley Life. Um, we're going to be offering a Berkeley Life special for all of our existing customers as well. And um, we're offering a promotion for Berkeley Life customers if they're interested in, in adding shockwave therapy to their practice. Thanks. Um, yeah, and from, from my end, <clears throat> thanks to Dr. Kavinsky, to Greg, and definitely to you, Sarah, too. It's, it's, you know, webinars can be stressful events, but this was fantastic to be a part of, and I'm hoping we can do it again in the future. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining here tonight. Yes. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you, guys. All right, have a good evening. Thanks. All right, Bye. appreciate it. Bye.